We're here to answer your game, gaming, or game night questions. So due to the fact that Anna and I just got home from vacation um, not too long ago, and we really didn't want to have to cancel the show two weeks in a row, we decided what we would do tonight is host an AMA and ask us anything. That's right. Tonight, we're going to be answering questions from the Lobby Art chat room here, live on Twitch. So start getting those questions in, lobbyists. So to get things started and give people time to get their questions in, I've got something fun we can do uh, here where everyone watching and listening can technically play along at home. Uh, you're going to go over to a new window, don't close us, and open up Board Game Geek, and you're going to sort the list by rank and find the games ranked 1,000 or higher, which I am going to also do over in another window over here. So this question comes from Cardboard Conjecture, host of the What You've Been Playing Wednesday podcast that Mo takes part in most weeks. They ask, what are your five top picks of games below 1,000 overall or even below 2,000 overall on BGG? And I think technically they mean above, uh, but, you know, below, yeah, they, lower in the lower ranks, lower above in the than, number. Yes, <laughs> yes. yes. But worse than 1,000. Yeah, worse than 1,000 or even worse than 2,000 overall on Board Game Geek. Now, I don't, I, 2,000 might be a bit much, so we're going to start with the 1,000. And again, here's your chance, chat room. If you've got any questions for us, get them in now. Uh, we do have a couple we copied over for your Discord, so you don't have to repeat those if you did ask them earlier. Now, in the meantime, what we're going to do is I haven't really prepped for this much. I did give it a cursory look earlier. I'm going to scroll through the list, and what I'll do is I'll mention the first five I find. So that'd be like the highest rank five games. But then I want to keep going and go through the full list and see pick like my five favorite out of all of them. And what I think I'll do is call out some other notables, just like, oh, that was a really good game. And oh, that one was neat. And I can't believe that's ranked so low. Yeah. Now, while Mo's getting started, I did a little early work to give him a little extra time to search. So I'm going to go through some, uh, some I found in some of those higher numbers. And right off the bat, I was shocked. Rallyman GT is at 1002 and I'm sorry yeah. but that game deserves to be in the top 1000. Rallyman GT is just a really fun accessible racing game. Yeah, I I can't deny that one. I I didn't put it on my list cuz I knew it was on yours. Rallyman GT is a solid game. I still haven't played a physical copy. I really want to try a physical copy of that. I think there's going to be like it's already good playing digital but yeah. like being able to hold the dice and stuff, I think it's going to be awesome. Uh, so next up is one both of us are going to share. And again, this is just just edging over that 1000 number at 1004. Our show favorite. There aren't too mm -hmm. many times we don't, you know, we, it's usually about every six to ten episodes that we'll mention this game. Ghost Fight and Treasure Hunters. Yeah, fantastic game for the whole family. Kids game that even adults will enjoy. Uh, now, I think uh, I think there's one you'll probably like in here before my next one. Do you want me to start going? Okay, so so start at the top of the list. Some I've noticed. Courier's stuck out to me right away. It's not a top five for me, but it's the first game on this list I would have no problem playing. I wouldn't turn down a game. Courier's a fantastic dice drafting, bag building, weird fantasy game that was fantastic when it came out, but then got overshadowed by Dice Masters. And I still say Dice Masters is the better version of Courier's, but I would still not turn down a game of Courier's. Oh, fair enough. And then the next one I have, of course, is Ghost Fight and Treasure Hunters. Again, I didn't put it in the top five because I knew you'd put it in the top five. <laughs> uh, and then... So Quarriers was at 1,003, Ghost Fight and Treasure 1,004. And I next dropped down to Diamonds at 1012. Again, I just want to call this out because it's a trick-taking game that I love because it's heart spades, clubs are all different games. Everyone knows, well, this is someone finally made Diamonds, and it's one of the few trick-taking games that plays six players. I wouldn't call this a top five, but Diamonds is a solid game at 10, 12. Right. So uh, my next one sneaks in, and this is one that we've talked about another version of, but uh, that's Ticket to Ride London, the short, brief, uh, sort of tiny map version of Ticket to Ride that's just enough Ticket to Ride that I don't get sick of it and hate it. Yep. And that's totally at uh, 1,015. All right, my next one that stuck out at 1027, Merlin. This may have been a top five for me, but it's not because I don't own it. I only got to play this game at Origins um, with the, not the designer there, but like the, the, the publisher there kind of coaching us on how to play it. This is a Rondell based Stefan Feld game set in the Arthurian period. It seemed fantastic. It's been on my wish list for a long time. That was at 1027. 
All right. I got to figure out when you're jumping back in and then I can uh, yeah, keep, keep going. Keep going. Keep going. All right. <laughs> this is what happens on AMAs where we're like <laughs> just scrolling through. Uh, next, I have Chimera Station. I want to call out because the other day we were talking about board game elements or video game elements we would like in board games. And at 1031, Chimera Station is a game where you it's a worker placement game where you can improve your worker. And I'll admit, it's not my favorite game. It's not fantastic, but I love that concept. And it was doing something new. It's not always you get a board game where it's doing something completely new. Absolutely. Uh, next one, you know what? I could I could have put this next one on here, and I didn't. I don't know why. You know, and I, I I skipped right past this one that you grabbed grabbed on here, and this is one of your top five, I think. Yeah, and that would be Galaxy Trucker. Um, any edition, the new edition, the old edition. Um, this one's got to be a top five. I'm mean, I mean, You know what I'll do is I'll go through the whole list, and then I'll I'll do my top fives after. I'll call out which ones are my top. Uh, so Galaxy Trucker is fantastic game, real time, build spaceships, go on a run, watch your spaceship get destroyed and hopefully make it to the end with at least some of a ship still together. Okay. Now, next one is one I pulled off of my list from Board Game Arena, and that's Haggis at uh, 1050. It is just a f- whoa, what the heck? What? I just uh, that's not good. I have no idea what's happening. Uh, they are gonna can't, they're gonna shut down on my meeting. Our meeting. What? Uh, apparently, two two person meetings no longer have unlimited time. Okay, right in the middle of a podcast episode. Remaining meeting time. Zoom no longer allows unlimited two person meetings. Apparently. So what do we end it and restart it, and then then we gotta find some alternative for next week? I uh, well, I mean, I well, yeah, I guess. Like we could jump to Jitsi, but that's not gonna work for. Well, it's uh, nothing set up for Jitsi. Um, yeah, exactly. Well uh, then, this is gonna be all right. Well, we got nine minutes. Um, we had nine minutes. All right, let's let's see if we can at least get through this question in nine minutes. Uh, I'll go a little quicker. Next one that caught my eye was Whistle Stop a train game that's not a train game that's about route building kind of has a zero element to it but it's a more of a heavy euro i do really like whistle stop next is primordial soup sean we need to put this on the list for you to play this yeah, is a, i know we've a, talked about this a number of times poop game and i never think to put it on the damn list this is a game where you play a, a microbe and you go around and you eat the poop of other microbes which causes you to poop so they can eat more and then you evolve your microbe to become multi-celled organisms or get jaws or tentacles or flagellum and you're trying to make your species survive in the primordial soup this is a fantastic game next i have fleet i gotta call this game out fleet is so good even Sean played Fleet yep. years ago. I'll admit we haven't played it in a long time, which is which is just new hotness. We're too busy playing the the old new hotness around here. But the Fleet Fleet is still one of the best card games out there, using the power grid auction mechanic and uh, engine building. Fleet, fantastic fishing game. Next, I've got the game. I, the game is way too good. Like it's it's cooperative. Try to play cards in order from one to a hundred or a hundred to one. I have no idea why it's that dang good, but the game. And I'll admit, you got to play it a couple times. Like when I first saw this and tried it, I was like, yeah. But until you sit down and play the game, you're like, oh wow, this actually has a lot more depth in it. Right. And Sean learned the game not this time he was down, but the last time he was down, and I think you agree. Yeah. No. Absolutely. All right, follow up the board game. This isn't going to be a top five, but man, it again does some really cool stuff. It actually makes you feel like you're playing the fallout game, but then totally flounders in other ways, like random items being found and random combat and runaway leader problems. So close to a fantastic game. With the expansion, this might have been higher. I haven't tried it. Fair. Yep, no, that's fair. Next is one I think Deanna would have on our list. That's Hacienda. Hacienda is is a hidden gem. It is it, there's a new edition that just actually recently came out. It looks very uh, brighter, but seems seems to be the same gameplay. Uh, it's it's a Euro game. You're you're placing tiles and animals and trying to collect route connect routes. Uh, huge hit. Hacienda. One that might have been higher on my list if I played it more sentient. We played this with Tori and Cat and really liked it, but so far I played the game twice. Really interesting dice drafting game. Yeah. Two games I thought would be way higher is Starship Catan and Starfarers of Catan. Two yeah. great versions of Catan that no one talks about. And I'll admit, Starship Catan, I think, has just dropped this low because it's been out of print so long that no modern gamers played it. 
Right. Like anyone new to the hobby has never even seen this game. So it just it's it's just going to slowly drop as it doesn't get new ratings. Right. Fantastic two player only version of Catan and Starfarers with the awesome ships with the beads in the bottom that you turn upside down and the random encounters you have in space while still rolling dice and collecting resources and building up your engine. Love both of those. Uh, Walking in Burano, the city, the city building game where you're you're building the city of Burano with cards and you get points for like having the most cats which is just such a neat theme in a game. Yep. And like you can have Santa Claus come visit at you because your your buildings have the most chimneys. Right. Uh, one of the lowest ranked ones I can't even believe is even on here is Middle Earth the Wizards. This is my all-time favorite collectible card game. We still have decks of the Wizards sometime. I don't think, Sean, I don't think you were around when we were playing that one. I no. almost want to break out a couple starters because I actually still have starters of that where it'd be like, just play starter versus starter. I, that's the game that destroyed magic for me. Once I got into Middle Earth, I pretty much stopped playing magic. Right. Uh, CV, the game about building your resume, which is just fun if you play with role players because you end up telling a story. It's like, oh, look, I started off as this and I got an internship at my dad's company, which let me tour the world. Meanwhile, someone else like, well, yeah, I had to sell my childhood bike to be able to get some other thing. Fair. Yep. Uh, Kingdoms, abstract strategy game from Rainer Nitzia that was redone as Beowulf, the movie, the board game, which is actually a better version of Kingdoms. But both are ranked terrible because no one knows these games. So, OK, we're good. Uh, I was trying to rush. Now I don't have to rush as much, nope. but really, I don't know. Android, we've talked about that before. The the ridiculous over the top um, trying to do way too much Blade Runner, Philip K. Dick board game set in the android universe that again i i almost wish i hadn't sold my copy just to show it off to people but it was like six hours of not always fun <laughs> yeah no absolutely. but it showed so much prom promise it dragged. yep <laughs> next up uh, on your list i think on uh, on your list yeah, i know go ahead is uh the climbers and I, absolutely this one this one i cannot believe this one is almost at 1500 it is such a fun game uh, I think one of the things that probably knocks it down is that it's not a dexterity game, yes. but it requires dexterity. Or people think it's a dexterity game. Possibly. Like like when you look at that box, you're just like, oh, it's another hamster roll or stacking game. Right. And that's not at all what it is. But it does require dexterity to play. Yes, Playing it drunk is, is really amusing. Yep. Our next classic games workshop, when they finally decided you could play Warhammer Fantasy without needing a thousand point army, Mordheim. Uh, you can see my copy just under my shoulder there. My copy of Mordheim still back there. It is one of two Games Workshop games I have a fully painted army for. So that game doesn't need a full army, but I actually <laughs> have a fully painted units and uh, some even customized after playing a couple battles with uh, Deanna's cousin. Uh, Sanctum, we just played that last time Sean was down. That is the Diablo board game. I am really surprised it's that low. Oh, we stopped. I Sorry, I stopped saying the numbers. 1551. Yeah, you know what? I mean, Sanctum, that's a this prod that doesn't really surprise me. It doesn't me. feel like a it's it feels like a top 500 to me. I, I Just mean, the feel, CGE, the designers. The the game is, I mean, pro, uh, production wise, yes, but I think the game really kind of bothers people because of the solitaire nature of it. Yeah, uh, it's, a lot it of is multiplayer like, solitaire. A lot of people don't like that solitaire aspect. If you're going to be fighting things, you want to either fight together or fight against each other, but not yeah. alongside. Not each other. doing your own thing. <laughs> yeah, the, the, like even the hate drafting of that. It's like, ooh, you grabbed the red one instead of me. Yeah, right. Exactly. Like you don't even know what the items are. See, the biggest one I found with that, where you didn't bother you when you played it, was I hate the transition from one style of play to the boss fight, which plays completely different. I, I, think I, I feel like I'm playing two different games. At it it would have bothered me more if I hadn't been well aware it was coming. Yeah, that's true. So uh, next, one of the most unique games in my entire collection is La Boca at 1595. We need to play this again, but we need a group like it's 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 like you need six or eight people to be able to play this game. It's a two player dexterity building game where you're each trying to build part of a pattern, but you can only see half of it. So I see one half, you see another half, and it's like, no, no, I, I can see a red, so move it so you can see a red. And there's a timer, and it's like one of those, you know, you're rushing, you get that adrenaline, you get done, you know? And I remember playing this and someone finishing in like a six second round after other people's had like a two minute round and like high fives happening and everything. 
Next, a massive four X game. This is another one Sean should probably try at some point. Exodus Proxima Centauri. The thing Exodus did that no other four X game had done at the time was diminishing resources. So you would get to a planet and it would have ore and you would put a D6 on it. And every time you mine the ore, it would go down five, four, three, two, one. Other than that, it's another Twilight Imperium, pick your role, explore, fight each other, build ships, upgrade your ships. But the neat thing was that diminishing resources was just something I'd never seen before. I'm going to slip in here and add one that you missed yep. in your in your number here. Oh, probably. You I'm scrolling battle through. Sheep. No, battle, battle sheep. <laughs> it, it, battle sheep is a neat game. I, I admit, if I was doing kids games. Battleship's fair. Battleship's one of those games you're like, wow, this is way better than it has any well, right. That, to yeah, be. and that's the thing. I mean, it's not a great game, but it's just way better than it has any right to be. <laughs> yep. No, I mean, exactly. Which probably means that uh, you know, at sixteen hundred or so, it's or sixteen forty or something like that. It's sixteen twenty one. It's probably about the right number for it. <laughs> yeah, I, that's higher than I would have guessed. Actually, I, I'm surprised enough people have tried Battleship to get it there. Right. Uh, next, Warhammer Disc Wars. This was Warhammer without having to buy miniatures done in very unique way. Now, I know it was based on an existing Disc Wars game, so it wasn't unique, but literally your armies were discs and to move, you flip them. And like to charge, you would flip three times. And if you landed on another disc, you won. And it had the best, um, you know, like multiple people get in a fight rule because you literally had a stack of discs and you just did them in stack order. Like this guy fought the guy under him and this guy fought the guy under him. And then eventually they battled the guy in the bottom. And, and, and it had all the, you know, the armies, the dwarves, the Skaven, the Empire, the orcs and goblins and unique units and everything was asymmetric. That was a hidden gem. And unfortunately, it was the casualty of Games Workshop pulling their license from Fantasy Flight or else it probably would still be going strong. Right. Uh, next one, this, this is probably the best game in the list, in my opinion, going up to 2000 is Hamster Roll, my absolute favorite dexterity game. I can never say enough good things about Hamster Roll. If you're going to buy one dexterity game, that's the one to buy. Yep. No, I can't can't disagree at all. I, I, you, I don't love all of the dexterity games you do, but Hamster Roll is one I have never complained when I see that one broken out. Yeah, great game. Uh, next, Quest of Valeria. This was Lords of Waterdeep, but done as a card game. And it's really good. It's got the whole thing where you have a hidden Lord. You're trying to do things. You're building buildings, playing cards out. But it plays like half the time of Lords of Waterdeep. Of all the Valeria small games, not the big box role for resource games, it's my favorite. Now, going back to classic Games Workshop again, 1858 ranked Dungeon Quest. This was like the third hobby board game I ever bought. I bought Talisman, and then I bought Warlock of Firetop Mountain, then I bought Dungeon Quest because it had a little talisman on the side, and it said, from the makers of Talisman. It's ridiculous. It's ridiculously random. It's not fair. Um, the player powers are completely out of whack. The whole point is go in and randomly draw dungeon tiles, trying to get to the center of the dungeon, grab some loot, and get out. What I can't believe is no one compares Clank to this, and they should because it's the exact same thing except Clank it makes it fair and it's a better game <laughs> but i just i have a soft spot for dungeon quest because i played a lot of that i had every expansion i even bought the miniatures which i painted with paint markers because i didn't even know what games workshop paints were at the time dungeon quest is just it, it'll always be a favorite it's not up here with the games workshop stuff because it's not a miniature game it's downstairs with my board games and every now and then we break it out and i gotta admit i usually have more fun than that with than i do with talisman when i break out my old copy so a couple uh, you jumped past here. Um, Lignum, have you guys not? Uh, are you, no, I haven't no? played it yet. You, so you haven't played it yet. I thought you, got, I thought you did get a play in. Uh, nope. And then uh, one that I that gets passed by a lot, and I've only played it digitally on uh, when we were testing all the different digital board games, and that's Keltus. Yeah, um, that one which looks is just a fun little a fun little game that we all played on. I forget which of the one of the board game ones i think we had to play it to, to, to mm -hmm. get past a certain thing and that was just a fun little uh fun little game all right last one this would be probably indiana's top five of the top top bot i don't know what do you call <laughs> bottom thousand out of the bottom thousand sync tear I, to me this is the ultimate next step game to ticket to ride you're collecting resources and delivering them based on random good value set at the beginning of the game i you're moving your little cart around this is just a fantastic game no one's heard of uh a great game from rio grande games and super hidden gem right now what i want to know i want to know this from sean first and then i'll do my own start at the bottom start at 1999 and go up what's the first game you're like sure i'd sit down and play that no problem 
Uh, I've, there's actually two on that last page, but the first one I get to is Scrabble in 1992. There you go. I mean, I just, you know, I mean, yeah. D might actually agree with me on that one too, you know. Yeah, I'm surprised Scrabble is that far down. I mean, I guess it's just yeah, it's that's too probably classic. And it, votes. Yeah, it's too, too classic and hate voting and, and all I, that stuff. I, for me, it would be Mage War Academy. Mage War was someone trying to make Magic the Gathering more realistic. So in that version, you make your deck, but you have access to your entire deck, the entire game. And you literally put it in physical spell books, which was just cool. You literally flip through your own spell book. When you summon a monster, it actually goes on the board as a miniature. When you put enhancements on or sorry, it's standees, but whatever. You literally moved around the board and battled your creatures. And like I said, it was someone trying to game up, like make Magic the Gathering more realistic. And I'll admit it was too much. Like it, it was a lifestyle game. It was too hard to do. I had no clue how to build my decks. Anytime I played anyone who knew what they were doing, they just absolutely destroyed me. But the entire concept of it, I thought was really good. And Mage War Academy is actually a dumbed down version of Mage War, where you have smaller decks and a smaller board. And I would totally sit down and play that with someone who knew how to play and could teach me instead of me having to learn it. And I would totally be like, just hand me a deck. I don't want to do the deck building. I don't want to figure everything. Just give me a deck, give me a miniature and let's go. And if, if you want to say, you know, I, I think it's arguable that Scrabble sort of is, is horribly misplaced and mm. shouldn't be there. Uh, if I were to jump up to the next one at 1974, uh, DC Comics deck building game Forever Evil oh, is up there, go. which I admit is not the best of them, but it yeah. is still a pretty solid expansion. It's no it's no Teen Titans, but uh, it's still worth <laughs> owning. All right. We got a ton of feedback from the chat, which was awesome. I'm glad we did this, actually, yeah. because we got people playing along here. Uh, first one, Math Guy Dave noticed Warhammer Quest. I never played Warhammer Quest. I played Hero Quest. I played Advanced Hero Quest, but I skipped over Warhammer Quest. And just above Conan on my pile of shame for people who know the Conan story is Warhammer Quest The Silver Tower, which I bought. I brought home and was like, yes, new Warhammer Quest. And I opened it and I saw miniatures I had to assemble on sprues. I put the lid back on the box and I put it on the pile of shame to get to later. That was, I don't know, 10 years ago, maybe longer <laughs> at this point. I don't know if I'm ever going to play it. Um, looking at it, it's got some really cool Slanesh miniatures. I don't know. So yeah, Warhammer Quest. Next up from Math Guy Dave, we've got Battletech. Yeah, the Battletech. There were a few different Battletech things in there. I thought about it. I like Battletech, uh, but it's mostly nostalgia. We got Magic Labyrinth, a classic. We recommend that one a lot. That yep. is the game that has magical walls you can't see. And it does neat things with magnets to work, but you literally move your playing piece and like, boom, oh, it hit a wall that you physically couldn't see. Uh, there, next... we we're talking about games with immersion. Going yeah. back to the video games, yep. games that make you feel like you're in the game. Magic Labyrinth wins for that. Yeah, especially because you feel the wall like like there is there is physical resistance for the non-existent yeah. wall when you do that. Absolutely. Uh, next up, Betrayal at Baldur's Gate. I've not gotten to try that one. I, I I think everyone knows my feelings on the Betrayal games. And based on everyone I've talked to, Baldur's Gate is better, but does not fix the issues I've had. Right. Uh, and then he's got Kodama at 1330. Solid one. Yep. I, that's just not one I called out, but I own it. I like it. It's it's neat. Um, People don't love it, though. Like, like I have that Sean Hamilton, not Sean from Hamilton, is a big fan of it. I'm a big fan of it, but that's about it for the local group. Like other people will agree to play, but Deanna is always like, yeah, let's play something else. Fair. Uh, we had uh, packs coming in. I had only ever played the Clever Cubed, but uh, thinks they like all the Clever games, which are coming in at 1026, I guess. Those are not ones I know. Mm. Uh, and she's pointing out that uh, 1,000 to 1,100 is Bellhop Bait. Yes, yeah, there are yeah. a lot of games there in there that uh... like I only I only called out a few <laughs> like Sean's just like do the first five that show up. And I'm like, well, by 1031, I've already got five. Oh, well, yeah, no, absolutely. Um, I mean, I had all my I had five. Oh, I didn't like get my top five. Sorry, I didn't get my top five. So let's back up a bit. My top five out of those are not the first five. Um, I got ha hamster roll. Middle Earth, the Wizards, the, the game. I like the game, the game. God damn it. See, bad spot for this. Primordial Soup. And Galaxy Trucker. Those are my five. Yeah. Uh, so we got uh, a couple of comments about our Zoom issues. Land versus Sea is at 21. Yeah, I didn't get down to the yeah, 20s. We haven't gotten up there yet. Uh, Machi Poro at 1091. But I know you're not a, a huge fan of Machi no, Poro. No, I, I did not. Especially the base game. Like just Machi Poro. Now, the, the, the new one that you just tried, uh, Cities and... Uh, Cities and Lights, which was a targeted exclusive that it combined two of the first expansions. 
It combined the Bright Lights, Big City, and the Harbor expansion with the base game. That was fine. I, I wouldn't put it it's on a top down, list. It's further down this list because I, I ran into it Surprising. later. Surprising. And you know what it is? Everyone loved Machi Koro at first, and then everyone decided it was broken. Right. So I think a lot of people didn't go in and edit their votes. Ah, uh, fair. So Pax is pointing out they love Blueprints at 1095. I've heard good things about that game. Not one I've played. Uh, Starfarers is great. The wonderful new edition. So Math Guy Dave called out Pathfinder card game at 2268. There's actually a, the Skulls and Shackles is actually in this thousand list. I looked at. Now, personally, I didn't play those old ones. I played the core set. If the core set was in here, I'd definitely say. My guess is the newest core set is higher. Right. Uh, New New York 1901 from PAX at uh, 1129. Yeah, that's a solid gateway game. (laughs) That's that's another, that's on my, we need to give it one more shot and either get rid of it because it's it's lighter, it's a gateway game, or keep it and play it more often. Right. Uh, and then um, Dave, Dave is pointing out that Aventuria is at 2572. See, that deserves to be higher, but no one can get no the dang can, game. No still. Played it. Yeah. Still, it's, it's been what, two years. Uh, and unfortunately my contact at Pegasus Spiel is no longer with Pegasus Spiel. So I don't even know what's going on. And Dee's pointing out that uh, she avoided playing the climbers because she thought yeah. it was a next game. Exactly. Like you look at that box and you're like, oh, it's a stacking game. I don't like stacking games, or I do like stacking games. Uh, there's Pax's beloved Super Skill Pinball 4K at 1222. Uh, Las, I still have to try it. Las Vegas Royale at 1400. Jamie loves that game. So one of the local gamers is a huge fan of that game, and I, I thought it was okay. I, I did not love it. Uh, we got Indigo at 1439. Oh, I missed that. That That's one I scroll past. Indigo is good, Soro. It, it's the only... Okay, so Soro plays up to eight. There's the bonus Soro has. But for a path game where all you're trying to do is build the path, Indigo is way better. I love Indigo. Indigo is up there because you don't own a spot for one, and you're trying to get gems to come out. But every time you give a gem to someone, they get points and you could get points. So you got to be really careful where they go out. Instead of just like, I, you're not, it's not, I want everything to come to me. If, that, if that's all it was, it wouldn't work. It's, I need some to go here and it's okay if they go here. It's really good if they go here, but it's not great at all if they come over here. And you're all playing on the same field. That, right. that almost should be on the Sean playlist just because it's, no, nah, I just want to play Indigo again. That's <laughs> all that is. It's been a while. Uh, and then uh, Six Nimit at uh, 1589, all-time fave card game. Lots of people love those Nimit games. I admit I've never tried any of them. We and should I know give it a like try the on, uh, on BGA. Yeah, yeah, just to see if it's a we if, know it's if on we can there, figure it out. But uh, and then Dave was saying that the core set was twenty two sixty eight, but he's not sure which edition of the core set that was for Pathfinder. Let's see when I uh, what did I close it? I had it open and then uh, browse board games. Let me look. Uh, let's see the twenty twenty no twenty nineteen core set is. Yeah, 2268. Yeah, 2268. So it was the Skull and Shackles base set is 1090. So there is definitely one in there. Yeah, in she games. I, I agree that Tabanutsu, the Incan Empire, does look good. That's number 2000. Mm-hmm. So that's that's a stop at the first game you're willing to play uh, way of, yes. of playing this. Sorry, uh... yes. Which I think that's cool. I like, go backwards and like, what's the first game I'll play? At some point, I don't, I don't know how to get to the end of the BGG list. And it doesn't work because there's so many games that are ranked NA. Yeah. It, that it, aren't it, ranked. At a certain point, I think it was around 3000. The list it just kind of falls, falls apart. apart. Yeah. Um, you can't you can't just go to the back and go. Uh, yeah, go it forward. looks like people do not like the new edition of the Pathfinder Adventure Card Game Core set. I didn't play the old, so I don't know. I just I, I liked it. We got overshadowed by Aventuria. Yeah, Aventuria did a similar thing, but better, in my opinion. All right, so there you have our top five of the games ranked 1,000 to 2,000. We've already spent enough time on this. I don't think we'll do the 2,000 today. Maybe something to do for another AMA. Fair enough. All right, let's go on to a question from Math Guy Dave. I don't know if you want to read this out. Sure, oh, so, there's this too. I didn't yeah, even yeah. see so this Pax, one. Pax actually asked us live in the challenge. Let's go to that first. Yeah, I missed it. Let's so do Pax, the live question. <laughs> Pax asked in uh, in the chat room, I just kickstarted Dead Ball Second Edition and got the drive through RPG to start reading through. I don't know how long it's been since you addressed this, but what are some sports themed games, sports themed games that you think are great? Oh, that's a full topic. 
We should do that. No, like that's that's something very <laughs> SEO friendly. There we got to go. do best sports games at some point. So well, I'll do a short answer here. I'll do just top of my head. No research, nothing being done whatsoever. Um, I got to start with the classic games workshop, Blood Bowl, which is not a football game. It's actually a rugby game, but don't tell fans that. <laughs> Because it really is. <laughs> yeah, there were there was a completely different rule set that they yes. offered to turn it into football, and but they it were wasn't. terrible. It was, yeah, it was horrible. Uh, they, they were not did not like those rules. So for with me, the kickoffs I, and the downs. For me, I mean, Blood Bowl, absolutely. Although I'd rather play that digitally these days. Uh, for me, I think uh, coming back to the list we just did, Rally Man yep. GT. I, it's yeah. you know, as long as you consider racing sports. I'm uh, I'm mm -hmm. there for uh, for that. And to go with that uh, Formula D is a, a fantastic. Uh, the best part about Formula D is you can play 10 players and then you can play it as heavy as you want. You can basically play the family friendly version where you're just rolling dice or you can get really into it and do like qualifying races and have to worry about your tires and your your engines and upgrading your vehicles and different driver skills. I love the fact the game has that breadth. Um, shoo. next one that came to mind for me, I, I'm trying to remember what it's called. It's, it's baseball highlights, but I can't remember what year. 28, 2045 baseball highlights, 2045. Um, I thought another one that should be on the list for Sean, just cause he likes deck <laughs> building. This is a deck building game where you start with your set deck. So it's, it's your team. And then you play through a game against another player. And then you get, you know, money and everything. And you can upgrade your team by getting new players, which then become new cards in your deck to play the next game. And you can, the best part, of course, is playing through a, a season. Um, though, like a normal game is a season. I think it's like four games, but like you can also do like a World Series. And then you can also play multiple players and stuff like that. This game is a fantastic deck builder and happens to be about baseball. Like it's really well done. The theme, though, turns people off. I can't find people to play this. Like I, when Big J lived in Windsor, he loved it. And me and him played a bunch of times. And my copy probably hasn't been played since. Right. Uh, I mean, pitch car is obviously going to be on the list for you. I'm gonna, yeah, though, that one's really pushing the sports. Yeah, I, I, I'm going I'm going by uh, BGG definitions right here. They definitely oh, they see, I'm, it, I'm not doing research. I'm just going off the top of my BGG head. BGG calls to look it up. a sports game. So uh, uh, Downforce, uh, have you have we recommended no. that one? No. I haven't played Downforce. I've heard really good things. It's a, it's Restoration Games. It's a remake of a classic game. Right. But I have not played. That's another racing one. Um, I would say Blood Bowl Team Manager. Uh, again, you're going you're going to um, deck building instead. Actually, Team Manager and Baseball Highlights are surprisingly similar now that I think of the two next <laughs> to each other. Because, uh, again, you're starting with your basic team, and then you're getting star players and skills and whatever, refs and all the other stuff and adding to it. Though so it wasn't the hit I thought it'd be with Sean. but um, <laughs> That is definitely a sports game. Uh, does Camel Up count as a game? Uh, it's a race. I don't know if you count that as a sport. Um, there is the the baseball highlights. There's now a football highlights, but I haven't tried that. Uh, um, there is not games, a good call that a sport. There is not a good hockey game that I know of. Being Canadian, I figure we should mention that. Hmm. I've no, there is an NHL deck builder, but it doesn't rate very well. Uh, yeah, there are a number fan, of different so. wrestling games. So, so oh, the really good one is the WWE Superstar Showdown. Yep. That is actually fantastic, but only comes with six players that I know nothing about. <laughs> um, we played that. It's 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 like a miniature skirmish game where you can like throw people out of the ropes and you can pin people outside. And there's a rock, paper, scissors aspect to it and programmed movement. So, yeah, WWE Superstar Showdown. Uh, Renye Nitsuya's Decathlon. <laughs> you, too, can play Decathlon with dice. There you go. Uh, it's basically the eight bit box. Oh, actually, yeah, the eight bit box yes, had track and field. Track and field, basically. I can't remember what it was actually called. Coliseum or something like that. That was really good, actually, because every game was played different. A lot of it was just um, like bluffing games where you're like, you put your dial to one thing, he puts it to something else, and then reveal. And uh, a lot of it was, and it was uh, resource management. It was how many points do you spend to win this event? Because if you spend all your points now, you're not going to be able to win the later events. And it was surprisingly good. Like we played that with 10 people, I think it was, or eight, whatever the max was. And it was, we had a good time. We did that at easy mode. Uh, interestingly, the number one rated sports game on Board Game Geek is Flamme Rouge, yeah, which is racing. the uh, bike racing game running yep. the, uh, the Tour de Force. Yep. Uh, 
That one's supposed to be good. I, I have not played for long. It is one. It has won a lot. Of, yep. It won or nominated for a lot of awards. See, uh, oh, uh, the NASCAR one, Thunder Out, Al- Thunder Alley, Thunder I think Ro- it's, Thunder Road, I think isn't it? it? No, Thunder Road's no, the, yes, the post-apocalyptic yeah. thing. Uh, I think it's called Thunder Alley. Again, I'm off the top of my head. So that's true. Math guy Dave should totally check out Flam Rouge. Uh, uh, what is it called? Thunder Alley, yes. Thunder Alley, yes. Yeah. Thunder Alley is really good, actually. Um, I already had Blood Bowl. There's like games about like skiing. There's husky oh, yeah. racing games. Well, that we we actually did like three or four different husky racing games yeah, on, on for, uh, Kickstarter. The one that one week, yeah, the one yeah. Sunday. But like before that, there were already some. Yeah. Um, the, the, what's the, there's a football one that's supposed to be really good, but I'm drawing a blank on what it's called. Uh, Blitz, Blitzball something. Blitzball, uh, no, Blitzball was, was, uh, another G- GW one. No, that's, that's the, uh, the easy blood bowl. Uh, uh, I'm drawing a blank. There's one, it was named after a video game. Oh, Techno Bowl. Techno Bowl. Yes, that's it. Techno Bowl. I haven't played it, it, but a lot of tech- people like, there's two different ones, the video game, one's the board game. It's techno and tech bow, and I'm not sure which one. I uh, think it's the no. Tech yes, no it's techno bowl. ball. Techno. Yeah, I get them confused, but that's supposed to be really good. There's, uh, yeah, it's, uh, there's tech, techno that's, ball, that's... arcade football unplugged from 2017. Yeah, that's the one. Yep. That is that. Now, from football fans, mm-hmm. I have been told this is the game. This is way better than Blood Bowl. The seasons are better. The leagues are better. And well, it's not silly in fantasy. It's rated an 8.6, yep. but it's still only ranked at 30, 3,500 overall. I think a lot of people didn't like it. I don't know. Eight, I, I, I won rated an 8.6. <laughs> yeah, 8.6 is yeah, really that's high. really high. Uh, it was nominated for a Golden Geek and a Board Game Quest. It didn't win. Which is still pretty good. Yeah. Dry Erase football game. We played it as a kid. I don't know anything that's Dry Erase football game. Um, yeah. Bottom of the ninth? Is a really quick two-player baseball game. I actually I, at one time had two copies of that. Pat Kelly had the uh, the vibrating mm-hmm. football game. We used to play that over at his place. You can still get that. I've heard, the company yeah. that makes that is still around. Which is such you a get weird custom custom teams and stuff. Yeah, that's that is such. I mean, it's really just like you just vibrate it. Watch, watch it play, and it's like, oh no, he fell over. You stopped the vibrations and set yep. up again. It was that was a weird one. Yeah, I know, I've, I've heard of those. I've seen them over the years, but I've never actually played. Um, racing game automobiles, which is a bag builder, really solid bag builder, actually. All the Stratomatic games, which I don't play. That, that that's a lifestyle thing. If you get into Stratomatic games, I think they're Stratomatic every sport, basically. Yeah. Um, did the gladiatorial arenas count? Arenas <laughs> did Spartacus. Off the top of my head, I think that's a yeah, mons I, I own. I'm, I'm trying to think. I almost need to go downstairs and look around. I'm, I'm trying to picture my shelves and think if there's any sports games. And Dave's saying sports sims are one of the things that are much better as video games. And in sometimes yeah. I agree, but when you get into some of the the manager games, when you get like when you get into the the sort of sports management type stuff, mm-hmm. then I think it does actually work rather well as a as a board game. Um, you can do a lot, especially like stats heavy games, right? If you've got a, a game like baseball, which is a very stat-heavy game, uh, mm-hmm. you can do a lot with that in a board game. Oh yeah, that's that's the whole thing with the Stratomatic and that. Um, the one I want to try, Luchador. It's it's a dice game with with Mexican wrestlers. Yeah, you and I think the, you the literally Mexican throw the dice. Yeah, yeah. I think you actually we just sell them all the time. I sh- there are deals on Luchador on Amazon all the time, but I never played it. I just I know it because I share deals to it all the time. <laughs> Um, there was that heavy miniature game from Cool Mini or Not and Eric Lang, but that wasn't based on a real sport that flopped terribly. What was that called? Use D12s. Chaos Ball. Mm, yes. The fantasy sport of total domination. That was a complete failure. It was actually a surprisingly good game. Uh, again, Sean Hamilton, not Sean from Hamilton, ended up getting my copy of that and like going deep into it and buying expansions and stuff. I right. know what I still need to figure out. My dad had that golfing game. Mm. Oh, there, there, there's Let's Bowl a game from the 60s. <laughs> yeah. That was absolutely terrible. Yeah, That was yeah. one of the worst games I ever played in my entire life. You said d- Dead Ball. 
And I thought you said Dreadball, which is a thing. Like, there's a game called Dreadball, and mm. it's... I don't know if it's popular or not. I just know it's a thing. Hmm. It's Dreadball, and it was super minis, but it was... um, It, it was a miniature-heavy game. Like, super miniature-heavy game. I remember the Kickstarters and stuff. Yeah, Dreadball, the futuristic sports game. Two coaches compete for victory with teams of beautiful miniatures on a stunning sci-fi pitch. So, yeah, when Donna said... She backed Dead Ball. Dead Ball. I thought it was Dread Ball, and I'm like, oh, they're reprinting Dread Ball. Uh, they, they did already, and the second edition for Dread Ball came out in 2018. Yeah, it was, it was recently. <laughs> I thought I remember a recent edition of that. Yeah, and it was like super. Looked like it, and, and like the they got Etsy involved, like so, all these acrylic tiles yes, and stuff. Yes, lots of acrylic. Uh, but yeah, there was Dread Ball, Dread Ball Ultimate, and then Dread Ball Second Edition. Wow. Yeah. There, Deanna's like, how, how much is uh, Luchador on sale today? <laughs> 47% off. You can get it for 21 bucks. There you go. But from what I understand, some of those physical ones, I don't know. There's like physical wrestlers. A wrestling there's... ring and wrestlers. See, I thought you threw the dice in the ring, but that's not what the back of this looks like. I don't know. I always look neat. It, it looked cool. <laughs> Right. I'm like every time I sell a copy, I'm like, man, that was a if Han Solo was was around and the border was more open, I would have considered it. Mm -hmm. Man, I would have spent so much money on Prime Day or <laughs> considered spending so much. There were some really good deals. Nerds Day too. Nerds Day was ridiculous. All right. Well, let's. Uh, Dave had a question for us yeah. in the Discord. What is the last game, board, RPG, card game that you would say you had an in-depth mastery of? Perhaps a game where you were in the top 1% of players in that knowledge. Uh, so digging deep into one game versus playing a ton of different games, which is now, I think, more what you do than that. <laughs> yeah, more than always. So I, 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 I don't know. That's the difference between Deanna and I. I'm the Epicurean. I want to try new things. I've always been like that. Um, Talisman, second edition, is is at least one game. I don't know about the last game, but it's definitely one game that I had ridiculous amount of knowledge of and then role-playing game would be warhammer fantasy roleplay first edition yeah. I, I could have run that game without any books and like gotten the street names of marionberg right and known the various like most of this knowledge i'll admit is gone now um talisman i i don't know how many characters i had because i also had all the white dwarfs but like i didn't have to ask you what your powers were i didn't have to read the board ever i rolled the dice and knew what was going to happen like i knew every spell in the deck and i would know if people are holding on to spells because we'd cycle the deck and i'm like nope someone's holding on to whatever could probably transmutation because i haven't seen it played yet and i knew exactly the odds of going into the talisman dungeon and there's only, I don't, actually only two cards worth getting in that entire dungeon so if someone else had already got one, then you didn't go in the dungeon. Like, and, and I knew that game way too well. So Talisman and Warhammer, there's a bit of an overlap there because I played both around the same time. And I've just never really been that competitive. I, I expect as a player, I probably knew Warhammer, um, you know, well enough. At I'm least saying, the background, yeah. Yeah, I mean, the, between the background and, and, you know, not necessarily, you know, needing the character sheet, understanding the roles, the crit mm -hmm. tables, and, you know, the player aspects of that game yeah. uh, and the crunch involved in that game. Uh, yeah, absolutely. I think I, I knew yeah. that one. But uh, I had the entire critical hit table memorized, like for all the different, each limb. Like I, yeah. I knew them all. Like there's only six for each, right? There's legs, arms, head, chest. I think those are all of them and there were six for each so it's not like it was it wasn't like the role master critical hit charts but i still knew most of the text verbatim right by chance one of your your arrow pierce what is it your arrow pierces into your opponent's side by chance one of the bone fragments severs a major artery death from shock and blood loss is almost instantaneous at least part of that is perfectly right the yeah. the, the by chance a bone fragment severed a major artery death by shock and blood loss is is instantaneous it was an actual quote from part of at least one of them oh yeah and, and if you got a if you rolled the six on the head you actually rolled to see where the head landed as it rolled so many yards away yep that was definitely it um modern games yeah, it's nothing for me i got i really like, have to say nothing like I, I don't know azul but like i never everyone knows like there's not anything to know <laughs> like I, I can teach it like i don't know it gets into like games i can teach without referencing a rule book I could definitely do that one. Um, Race for the Galaxy, up to a point. Race for the Galaxy, the first three expansions, I have played over 100 games. So 
and I know card counts and I know what to watch for. And I know that there's three of the jeans cards in the deck, but I wouldn't say top hundred one percent. I'm probably in top 20 percent with Race for the Galaxy. And again, only with the first three expansions. Once you go past that, I got no clue. Right. I'm trying to think of those others. Warhammer was definitely the RPG. Cyberpunk 2020, I was up there. But again, I wouldn't be in top 1% because I didn't own anything. No. Warhammer, I owned every book that was published. And now finally have the one that wasn't published because they finally published it years later. But I don't know that book, actually. The, my 1E Warhammer knowledge does not expand to the realms of sorcery because I got it long after I'd stopped running the game. Well, yeah. Um, TSR Marvel Superheroes, I was up there. But again, I didn't own every module, every expansion. I, I could never find a copy of the Ultimate Powers book, which is the rarest book in the set. So I'm like, I knew it well, I could run it. I had the universal chart memorized, but I didn't have it memorized in the fact that like, if you had an exceptional and you rolled a 92, well, that'd be, okay, that'd probably be a red. But if you rolled a 33, I couldn't tell you if that was a success or not. I would have had to still look up the chart. So to me, that doesn't put me in the top 1%. Mm -hmm. I don't know, games we've mastered. <laughs> Yeah, no, I, I can't think of really anything modern. Like Magic the Gathering, I was a, a judge at tournaments, but that's that's like going back to revised time period. Yeah. Where I mean, like I knew like section 3.6.2 of the rules and all the timing and how I'd artifact. So at one time, yes, Magic the Gathering. In the revised era of Magic the Gathering, up until Ice Ages, I could run tournaments and be a uh, whatever. But that, what but that got it? knocked the, out pretty fast because, I mean, that game just evolved so fast if you didn't stay up and they, they don't have they didn't have the digital version to to be able to stay up and play all try all the new cards and see all the new yeah. combos and things so yes at different. one time at one time magic the gathering to the fact i knew every card and what every card did like I, I, there was never the oh let me read that card no i <laughs> there was a period of time when i got into magic that was that you know it's that that the happy spot where it's early university where like your courses are hard but not too hard and you have free time and you have lots of time between your classes because they're at stupid times or like you got to be there at 8 a.m and your next course is at 4 p.m and you're like what do i do all day well we played magic or read scry magazine or <laughs> whatever that's what we did yep all right all right uh, do we want to do one more or not i'm thinking we might want to save this for something else yeah it's a it's a for next time that, that, that's question. a heavy one i think we'll save for another episode yeah, dave's saying i mastered ma magic five years after you <laughs> yeah see five years so I, I think we can do this little one because that that but i think we'll skip sorry axe we're going to skip your heavier question we're going to do this this one yeah so um and this will probably be the last question if anyone's got anything quick they want to throw in feel free uh so uh Hello there, 100 asked, in regards to your episode on copyright, are shapes, letters, and numbers of bicycle playing cards copyrighted? Okay, I don't know if it's copyrighted. I'm just going to say protected because I never remember what falls under copyright, what falls under IP, and what falls under trademark. The 52 cards, the numbers, the symbols, ace, jack, spade, whatever, all those, you can do whatever you want with. That's all in the public domain. Specific fonts and specific changed symbols. So if like someone does their hearts different than a standard heart, and of course the card backs are protected because that's artwork. Yeah, so generally speaking, um, as, a, as a general rule, and this is coming from stock art photography, uh, uh, photography sites who have to pay a lot of attention to what is copyrighted mm -hmm. and trademarked because they can't sell a stock art photo if there is a protected item inside the image. Uh, and so the backs of cards are pretty much right out. Assume that everything on the back of a card is protected at some, by something. Um, the Joker, the Ace of Spades, and any uh, of the face suits which are non-standard, which you look at the go, and if you look at it and go, oh, that's interesting, it's probably protected. And it's, yeah. if it's not just your standard Jack Swing, Jack Queen King, um, that's yeah. the it's the Joker. Now again, the that's Ace. the art for those characters, yeah. not jo the J. No, but even even the art is generally not protected. If you look at it and go, oh yeah, that's just yeah, I've, I've seen I've seen that jo that Joker or that Jack a million times. Yeah, the times. whole yeah, the suicide the Jack. Jack and the yeah. 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 But uh, if, if you look at it and go, oh, that's interesting, then it's art and it's going to be protected. Uh, but yeah, generally speaking, the jack, the ace of spades, the card backs, 
um, and then potentially any faces. But when it comes to just the number and the symbol in the corner, oh. almost where the, the card layout, the card design, the deck composition, all of that is public domain at this point. Yep. You can go make your own deck or whatever you want, uh, which is why you see lots of decks out there that aren't bicycled. There are tons of companies out there reusing it. Um, as for the mechanics of the games, those are not protected either, but at full episode, we get into lots of detail <laughs> about that aspect of it. Yep. So you're free to do whatever you want with those cards. Yep. No, absolutely. But yeah, if it's artwork, if, if it's unique, right? So yep. every deck of cards has the same thing in it. That the stuff that's the same in every deck of cards is for use. That's why it's being used so often. Yeah. But the actual artwork on the cards, and again, like if you do a funky A for the ace, or if you use a specific font for the two, that can be protected. Yeah, so what, and I mean, even the fonts generally are licensable um, sort of things. I think a lot a lot of this what comes comes down to is a lot of people are trying to make a game and they want to use a deck of cards, but they don't want to make one from scratch because that's a lot of work. And, you know, the default ones from Microsoft look like garbage. So they would love to be able to scan in their favorite set of bicycle cards. Yeah. Uh, and they can, except for the Joker and the Ace of Spades. Uh, and so as long as you make, as long as you, you know, take a look at them, most of those cards, you're probably fine. Uh, and then just, you'll have to adapt anything that, that is clearly original art. Yep. Or potentially, not even clearly, potentially original art. Yes, <laughs> potentially. Potentially. So yes, uh, can't copyright mechanics, can copyright. Well, again, I, I don't remember the term. Arts Is art covered under copyright? That's uh, under art is covered under, property. Well, art, art is covered under copyright, um, but it's also it can also be copied under trademark. Uh, right. Copyrights expire. Trademarks need to be removed, renewed, but can continue on forever, basically. Mm -hmm. Uh, so the 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 bicycle symbol of their company logo that yeah, is a the, trademark the speed that is a trademarked piece of art uh, that is uh, renewed underneath their uh, company name. All right, we answered a few questions there. I think we're probably pretty good to move on unless you got something else. No, I think that's about it. So that is it for tonight's AMA. Thank you, everyone who gave us questions to ask. Hope to see you all back here next week for our fourth anniversary episode. <laughs> and questions to answer, not questions to ask. I don't know if that was yeah. me or you, but whatever. We know what we're here for. We're here to answer your game game night questions every week. Well, most weeks, pretty much every week. We don't miss that often. If you got a question for us, head over to the website, click on Ask the Bellhop, fire off an email to questions at tabletopbellhop.com, or hit us up on social media where we can be found everywhere as tabletopbellhop, one word.